Well, Carol, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm not really a professor, I'm a, an honorary professor, I feel me. Um, I would first of all thank the organizers very much for doing me the honor of asking me here, which is a huge pleasure. Uh, I've come here, first of all, really to learn things, to listen and to learn. But secondly, I come here to congratulate you because uh, my view of what you are all up to is that you are thoroughly subversive. <laughs> and a very good thing too, because what you're doing is you are breaking the point of one of the modern 20th century state's most insidious but sharpest instruments of control. You see, when a local community begins to take over its past, and that's not just learning about its recognized monuments and relics and so on, but it's creating larger or quite new pasts by excavation, by argument, by survey, by redefinitions. When that happens, then the heritage word begins to lose its negative charge. And I think it has a strong negative charge, or has had. I mean, look at the word itself. It's kind of neo-medieval. It belongs to late 19th century, uh, early 20th century, in this kind of usage. Mm, it implies a kind of hankering after a mm, unchanging layered kind of society. Its uh, connotation is with property and legacy, and it's kind of saying, someday, son, all this will be yours. <laughs> all this will be yours, whether you like it or want it or not, you see. That's the authoritarian, part of the authoritarian content of the idea as adopted by governments. It's we, Governments, we, the Aegeans, not you, who define what this national inheritance consists of. We, not you, if they are a patriotic duty to preserve and maintain this treasure and add it on in the same condition. You see, the next generation, then the next, and the next. And uh, you see, whether you want it or not, someday this will be all yours, and to protect it, of course, is becoming criminalized. Now, in this way, Heritage for this industry can be seen as a modern addition to the nation states, the instrumentarium of control. It reinforced, I put this in the past because, because of people like you, this is changing. It reinforced the mythical cult of national continuity and, in effect, it nationalized the past. And naturally enough, it identified this past as a resource. You know, an Arab Baden in his time once complained, he said, how can there be shortages in this country which is entirely composed of coal and completely surrounded by fish? <laughs> and, uh, you know, this island, and the island like uh, Ichabo in Namibia, or many Pacific islands, you see, which are covered with British sailors found in the early 19th century, I 30 to 40 feet of solid guano burnt down, which could be exploited. Wonderful. Now, what about these islands, the British Islands, the Telegram? Yes, of course, the discovery in the beginnings of the heritage industry of the by governments was that the British Isles also are covered by a huge deposit of past 10,000 years thick, and you can exploit it, you cut it up. You dry it, you sell it in briquettes, and <laughs> you become, the nation becomes rich. Now, so, let's say the official concept of heritage has been essentially authoritarian, who designates what is to be heritage. More interesting still, who decommissions heritage and say, that's not heritage anymore, forget it. And it goes on that very secretly, as many of you perhaps know. What well, is everything to be kept? Everything. I mean, then you go, what happens when everything is kept? Well, you get, and what is an organism whose metabolism has a process of ingestion but no excretion? You know, 
I mean, it just, well, it just gets you got to be a culture of bursting constipation. <laughs> it really, really is important to try and deal with this difficult subject. Disposal, disposal, as people say. It's a reality. Anyway, the huge significance of community archaeology and community heritage as ideas and practices is that they reverse this authoritarian trend. We decentralize, they, in quotes, one way of putting it at least, return the past to the people. And uh, it's linked, of course, to two recent movements in theory and practice, one of which is public archaeology, and the second, really one of public archaeology's children, so to speak, indigenous archaeology. The public archaeology, well, this is not the time, I don't have time to explain what it is, but broadly speaking, it's the view of archaeology which says uh, archaeology is much, is even more about the living than it is about the dead. It's even more about the present than it is about the past. Archaeology is highly political. It impinges on every kind of aspect of public life and administration. It cannot possibly regard itself as an academic ivory tower which is engaged in the world as it is, and you have to recognize that and fight. Um, that's one kind of approach to a definition. By the way, uh, never confuse that sort of definition of public archaeology with the American definition, which is quite different. When Americans talk about public archaeology, they mean essentially archaeology carried out on public lands, like the Department of Defense lands, reservations uh, with public money, and they draw from that, they say, well, if we're using public money, the public are entitled to see what we're doing, so they can sort of stand on the edge of the trench and look and have it explained to them, you know. That is not really what we in this country, I hope, mean by public archaeology. Our definition is much more adventurous and deeper. Indigenous archaeology, uh, that's really to do with one world archaeology concept of the late Peter Akko. And it means bring on the archaeologists from the local population itself who have very different ideas about what the past is and how it may be relevant and how it may still be alive in the present. Um, this, of course, is to do with the beginnings of the World Archaeological Congress and the <coughs> decision to composer to use all its funds for inviting uh, archaeologists who were themselves Australian Aboriginals or tribe people from the districts of Africa or India or wherever you might be. And uh, th their respect for scientific method will be as good as that of the present generation of college trained professionals, but their ideas about what's living and what's dead, for instance, may be very different indeed. So these are all got fine vision, but you know much better than I do how tough it is to get there and the obstacles, to name a few, with which you are all familiar. You know, first of all, what is a local community? How do you define it? Um, you know, we're really in trouble with the, with the you know, the latter form definitions of local communities. Maybe I would think the the late <coughs> Professor Gwyneth Williams, great Welsh historian, who said, uh, you know, what did, what's it mean to be, what is Welsh? What's it mean to be Welsh? How do you define somebody who is Welsh? Okay, well, somebody who lives in Wales and is committed to Wales. That's it. No more. I always liked that because it's economical. <laughs> Second uh, of the problems, you know, is that part of the local community which you can mobilize? Is it a representative? Oh dear. You know, I mean, is it that? My answer to that is, if it isn't representative, does it matter? You know? This has been a big problem in successive Scottish governments as well, uh, you know, since devolution about how you carry out consultation with the 
usual suspects, or how do you get past the usual suspects? <laughs> Three, what happens if the people who live in and or work in a given cultural landscape are actually divided about how to engage with the past? Some say, oh, let's make a, a big track leading to this cairn and see lots of signage all around. Other people say, that's the last thing we want. We do not want more visitors disturbing the peace, leaving gates open, uh, ruining rural peace, and so on and so forth. And others still say, if you close the quarry, just because it's eating into the edge of the hill fort, or destroying this uh, particular hench through the gravel pit, what happens to the quarry families in the village? What happens to the building industry locally? So this is one of the classic problems, which is recognizing the multiple use of landscape. Uh, and that is something which most of you will have come up against, and to which there are no easy answers, except that there is a sense in which all uses of an ancient landscape, including the archaeological use, which makes the life for people like you, that's legitimate. So is the, unfortunately, the gravel pit owners. They have rights too. So does the land. So do others. That's the work out. And lastly, how can a local community insert itself into decision making in a field which in effect dominated by powerful distant institutions who are accustomed to controlling funds, to choosing projects, excavation and research, and so on. Uh, and that is um, something which is still to be solved, uh, and many of you, probably most of you, have had that problem at the local level of trying to get your voice heard in higher decisions about what to fund and what to do and what to pay attention to. So a possible one, but of course very ambitious way forward, is um, to create permanent community institutions uh, which are about everything about more than just archaeology. Now I'm uh, lucky enough to be a trustee of the Martin Museum, and in a way we have tried to do something like that, to be a place for meetings and eating and celebrations and exhibitions, so it's a community centre as well as a place, a centre for the interpretation of this huge ritual landscape beside us. A display museum as well, a base for research excavation as well, but above all, you know, trying to make ourselves a community institution in the broadest and most multiple sense, so that we can shoot out from there and engage more easily with the higher levels of decision making. Anyway, you know, there are of course all sorts of perils in this, um, you know, the one of the things which again must be familiar is um, suspicion which you would attract if you set up in such institutions or try to do so of setting yourself up as a rival to existing structures of power in the community, whether it's Kirk Session or the <coughs> Laodocracy, or whatever it may be, or even sometimes if you have your market, you know, problems with competition, the museum shop, the local shop, I think that this can arise. Now I'm coming to the end because this is other, just a very brief series of remarks to congratulate you. But my summing up is to say, you know, there has always been a struggle for the past between the powerful and the less powerful. And it's taken many forms over the centuries, if not over the millennia, you know, between the possessors and <coughs> the lower order of society, uh, the leaders of the commonality, whatever we call them. You see, I've always been this feeling that uh, to find something, to find buried treasure, is, and to keep it, is a sort of prescriptive right of ordinary people. No matter what the law may say, no matter, what, no matter why much the law may favor, you know, 
the king, the crown, through Monarch Arcantia interpretation, or whether it's the local land who says that belongs to me, find it on my land. There is always somewhere deep down, throughout Europe, certainly, all of Europe, this sense that somewhere deep down is a frustrated right to keep what you find. See, that has gone on all the time, and it is absolutely negative, because it can be transformed into something good. Okay. Um, and uh, the whole, in our own time, the, the method of tetrists who have inherited that, and then the, the, what we now see, of course, is this merger of the, the metal detectors with the professional archaeologists and so the conflict which has gone on for so long between ordinary people going about their business and, and professional archaeologists who behave as if they were a priesthood <laughs> and who, you know, nobody else is allowed to understand what they're doing and to understand what the ends of the trench and look for the same, you know. Uh, and that is now coming to an end. And it's coming to an end for largely because of what you are doing. So, by all I will say is that you, this sort of community has got to be quite new from in this age old struggle about who owns the power. And the prospects are really very bright for you. You are changing the flow of heritage, history, and the treatment of the past. And I think, you know, the flow, the force is definitely with you. Congratulations. <laughs>